Okay. Okay. Amen. Amen. All right. Good evening. Good evening. Man, great to see a church house full on a Wednesday night. Amen. What a blessing. Y'all, everybody came to hear the Bible priest, right? Amen. It means you love the Bible. Amen. Amen. Even when it tells you to do something you don't want to do. It's a conference on the home and the family, and um, probably one of the most controversial topics we could ever speak on. It really is. Well, yeah, um, I like to have fun. <clears throat> I kind of get bored at home, and I like to get, have fun on Facebook every now and then, our church Facebook page. And so I found this, this news article where a guy went and he got a sign, and he stood outside of an elementary school somewhere in America. And, uh, he held, and on, on his sign it said, Santa is fake, Jesus is real. And they, they tried to arrest him. And, uh, to, you know, talked about, they interviewed the principal and said, oh, it's just horrendous what this man's doing to, to hurt our kids and psychologically damage our kids. And, yeah. and so I'll put it on our church Facebook page with the, with the heading, Parents Don't Lie to Your Kids. And uh, got way more angry faces than thumbs ups. So... <laughs> Anyway, before I turned the comments off, some lady thought that she could tell me I shouldn't tell her how to raise her kids. And uh, I don't know why you wouldn't want somebody to encourage you not to lie to your children. Anyway, God's been really good. I tell you what, man, we, last year was such an encouragement to me being here and uh, really, really helped my heart. God's just been even better to me this year than I deserve, been better to our church than we deserve. And uh, we've gone through troubles and trials like everybody has. And uh, our homes have suffered greatly. And so I guess I'll say this to start out tonight. This conference, I think, is very timely uh, because the Christian home is under attack like no other in this, in this world. And uh, it's, it's the front line. It's the battleground. And if the devil continues to mess up our homes and we continue to allow him to destroy our homes and our churches... Uh, we're going to be a sad, sad state very soon. And uh, many churches are seeing that already. Our church is no, no uh, stranger to the troubles that come through marriage problems and divorce and family problems. And uh, just in the last, I don't know, month, you know, two or three or four, uh, either in our church or outside that I've been involved with and, and had to counsel with. And it's just, it's where it's at right now. It's where the fight is right now. And so if this conference can shore up your home, and help your home, then there's a chance that this thing will keep going for another generation. And God grant it. God grant it. We sang the song tonight, and, and you know, as, as you do, what was the first song we sang? He's the Lily of the Valley, right? And uh, that first line, I, my heart just rejoiced, because it says something like, I found a friend. And we sing another song in our churches, uh, called Hallelujah, I have found him whom my soul so long had craved. Jesus satisfies my longings through his blood I now am saved. And uh, that line about that friend was such an encouragement to me because that's what I'm going to talk about a little bit tonight. If you've got your Bibles, let's go to Genesis 18. Genesis chapter 18. <clears throat> in this message and in my message tomorrow afternoon, I'm going to be looking at Abraham both times. Here in Genesis 18, you're probably familiar with the story. It's right before God destroys Sodom and Gomorrah. And it, it appears that two angels and the Lord himself come to visit Abraham and Sarah. And they tell him he's going to have a son, the promised son Isaac. And you remember uh, Sarah laughs in the tent. And God says, why would you laugh? She said, I didn't laugh. He said, yeah, you did. Remember all that stuff. <laughs> and so uh, they get up to leave. And Abraham goes walking with the men. And the two angels go on to Sodom and Gomorrah. And the Lord stops. And he has a conversation with Abraham, and we're not going to be looking at, uh, you know, Abraham, well, 50 and 40 righteous and 35 and 30, you know, we're not looking at that tonight. But there's a passage here that's really struck my interest uh, over the years. I've preached this at Spring City. I have challenged, and I probably will say this tonight, uh, this will be a challenge to the men. We need godly men. We need godly men leading our homes. Because if we got godly men leading our homes, then we can have godly men leading the church. But you can't have godly men leading the church who are not godly men leading their home. It's out of order. 
And so tonight I'll, I'll, I'll primarily speak to the men. And uh, ladies, that doesn't mean that I don't love you or that I'm not focused on you because it'll all t- tie in here together and wrap around by the time we're done, Lord willing. All right, Genesis 18, verse 16, the Bible says this, And the men rose up from thence and looked toward Sodom. And Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. Verse 19 is where we'll spend a lot of our time tonight. God says in verse 19, For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. I'll give you the title tonight and give you the thought. You can be mulling it over as we go through the message tonight. God knew this about Abraham. In other words, God had some confidence in Abraham. That Abraham was going to do the things that pleased God. And I wonder tonight whether you're a man, whether you're a woman, whether you're a child. Can God count on you? To do your job in the home so that Jesus Christ is glorified. Can he count on you like he could count on Abraham? And with that thought, let's pray. We'll ask God to help us. Father, we love you tonight. Thank you for the opportunity to be at Bear Trail Baptist Church. Lord, thank you for all these people who've made the effort to come and be here tonight. I do trust, Lord, that we're all here for the right reason. We've come to get something out of your word that will help us and sharpen us and cause us to love you better and serve you better in the days to come. And Lord, we do pray for the homes that are represented here, not just here, Lord, but even even at other churches, Lord, at my church at Spring City tonight, the other churches represented here. Father, I pray you'd strengthen our homes. Lord, help us to make it a priority. God, we've seen so much tragedy and so much hurt and so much heartbreak over the last few years. Lord, we need your help tonight to touch our hearts and to help us to take this thing seriously, this topic about the home and the family. I pray you'll help me tonight to speak with charity and to the edification of the church. And may the preaching be in demonstration of the spirit and of power. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you look with me again there, in verse 17, God asked this question. He said, the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham... This thing which I do, and if you hold your place right here in Genesis, go with me to John 15, very quickly, John 15. Turning time doesn't count against the 45 minutes, right, brother? No. John chapter 15 just helps, I think it really helps to to read these things. I know I could just quote these verses and write them down in my notes and we can move on, but I think it's good for you to see this. God asked the question, he said, shall I hide from Abraham? Now, If you think about uh, the friends that you have in your life, there are people in your life that you tell things to that you don't tell to everybody. They're your friends. They're your closest confidants. Uh, If you're married tonight, I hope your spouse is your closest confidant. (laughs) Boy, uh, yeah, that's a whole other message. Anyway, John 15, (laughs) verse 13. Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. 15, verse, look what Jesus says, verse 15. 14 now, chapter 15, verse 14. Ye are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. But why was Abraham God's friend? Because he did what God told him to do. And he says, verse 15, Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father have I made known unto you. Jesus said, listen, my friends, I'm going to tell them some things. I'm going to tell my friends some things that I don't tell everybody else. And he says, Abraham, he says, I can't hide what I'm getting ready to do in Sodom and Gomorrah from Abraham. He's my friend. How about that? It'd be good if we had some homes and some fathers and some mothers and some kids that were God's friends. A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. I think God's done his part, don't you? He didn't just show himself friendly to the people that liked him. He showed himself friendly to the people that hated him. And now it's up to us to reciprocate and say, Lord, look at all you did for me. Now, let me do some things for you. 
James chapter 2, verse 23. Don't turn there. You can go back to Genesis 18, actually. But James 23 is where Abraham's called the friend of God. And uh, strangely enough, that's the chapter of the Bible that talks about your faith will be evident by your works. You know, we're not saved by works. We understand that. But once we're saved, there ought to be some proof there. Listen, you saved tonight? But your family ought to be different than the world. You saved tonight? Sir, you work that job and you, you come home and, and you ought to be different to your wife than an unsaved man would treat her. You ought to treat her better. <laughs> Ma'am, you saved tonight? I don't know. <laughs> Got some guys raising hands. So we'll worry about that later. <laughs> Listen, listen, lady, ma'am, ma if you're saved tonight, there ought to be a difference in your life than the way that the women in the world act. Right. The way they care on it. Your kids are saved tonight. Praise God. Our little Claire got saved this year after Bible school. It was the sweetest thing. They ought to be, our kids ought to be different than the world. So Abraham's called the friend of God. Why was he called the friend of God? Because he believed God. He obeyed God. He worshiped God. And I wonder how much of that describes us not at church. How much of that describes us at home. Because if it's natural at the home, it won't have to be artificial when we come together as a church. If the Bible's being taught at home, then it won't have to be this, this catching up to do when we get to church. It's just natural to come in and love the preaching of the Bible. And if the, if the hymns are sung at home, then it's just natural when we come to church. And the singing is to glorify God at the church. And really, I say this at our church all the time. The church is not a substitute for what should happen at home. I'm glad we got Sunday school. I'm glad we got Master Club. I'm glad we have children's church. But that shouldn't be the only teaching your kids get if you're saved. They ought to be getting it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And then when they come to church Sunday, yeah, it's just, just supplemental. It's a real blessing then. <coughs> Amen. Verse 19 of Genesis 18 now. God says this, verse 19, for I know him. Now certainly we would, we would understand that God knows us, right? He, he sees everything about us. Everything's naked and open unto him with whom we have to do. We understand that. But if we're thinking about a friend, friends know each other. <laughs> Can I say it this way? Families know each other. Friends know the good and bad about us. Our family members know the good and bad about us. You want to find some dirt on me? I got two daughters here tonight and a wife. Be enough to bury me. <laughs> but if you do that, I'm coming after you. <laughs> but come on, is that not just the reality of the situation? Is you know, we come to church and we all put the facade on, but what's going on at home? Is it consistent back at home? And God says, I know him. Friends know each other, friends know what each other likes and dislikes. Friends know each other's tendencies. A friend is someone with whom you will have an open heart and spend time with. A friend is someone you can count on. Now, Jesus is my friend. I can count on him. But I wonder tonight, can he count on me? Jesus is my friend. Listen, I know what he likes. I know what he dislikes. My Lord likes me spending time with him. And by the way, I'm, somebody will probably say this throughout the, the course of the conference, but uh, one thing that I heard early on with our girls as we were raising them was uh, children spell love, T-I-M-E. Daddies, mommies, you will never regret one minute you spend with those kids. And so God says, I know him. He's my friend. Boy, what a title. I want to be God's friend. He says this in verse 19. He says, for I know him. And here's what God knows about Abraham. Here's what he's confident about. He says that he will command his children and his household 
And before I get to commanding his children and household, I want the last two words of that phrase, after him. You know, the Bible says in Proverbs 23, 26, Solomon writing, he says, My son, give me thine heart. Do you know how big of a statement that is? My son, give me thine heart. Daddies, you ought to want to win your kids' hearts. Because if you don't win them, somebody's going to. Give me thine heart, Psalm says, and let thine eyes observe my way. Now, if Abraham's going to command his children and his household after him, that means Abraham's going to have to be righteous. If the family's going to go in the right direction, that means that Abraham, as the head of the house, is going to have to do right. He's going to have to be right. He's going to have to obey God. It's a big responsibility, bringing kids into the world. It's a big responsibility to be the head of the house, gentlemen. It's a big responsibility. Not something that we ought to shirk. And if, and if I know work comes up and you got things you got to take care of, I understand all that. But I'm telling you what, man, there's some guys that lose their houses because they're just so busy in the ministry, so busy at work, so busy chasing a paycheck. The Bible says in Proverbs 11:29, it says, The man that troubleth his own house shall inherit the wind. I hate to get carnal, Brother Tim, but it's the way we understand things sometimes. I haven't listened to it in a long time, but I understand there was a, a rock and roll song, maybe in the 70s, called The Cats in the Cradle with the Silver Spoon. I know that's a secular song. There's a lot of truth in that song. Now, don't go home and YouTube it tonight. <laughs> if you don't know what it means, ask Brother Tim, Brother James, these guys that listen to it regularly, you know, they... <laughs> I didn't say the old cat. <laughs> but the gist of that song is the dad was too busy to spend time with his son, and his son grew up to be just like him. And when his dad wanted him to come over and visit him, he said, I don't have time. Well, that's sad. Moms and dads, we get one chance at this thing to raise these kids and to win their heart from away from the world. God help us to do it. God help us to do it. Bible says that Abraham, God said, I know he will command his children and his household after him. We understand in 1 Timothy chapter 3, as God gives the qualifications for the bishops and for the deacons of our churches, that for both offices, the man has to have his household in order before he can ever be in the position in the church to lead the church. God's very clear about that. He says if he doesn't know how to take care of things at home, there's no way he'll be able to take care of things at the church. A lot of churches get that order. They're just too glad to have a man that will stand behind the pulpit, and if he's not right with God, he's going to tank the church. It's going to be an absolute disaster of a mess. And so the, the, the qualification is that a man must, and I like the word that God uses, is rule his children and his houses well. You know, oh, it's male chauvinistic. Quit listening to the feminine doctrine. God put the structure in place. It's not that I'm, I'm preferring one way or another. I'm preferring God's way over the world's way. And God's way is God's the head. Then the man's the head of the woman. And then you have the woman and then the kids. And I like this. If you've never read this book or maybe you have read this book and you don't like this book, it's okay. I still love you. It helped me tremendously. Dr. Tab down in Florida uh, Harold Tabb wrote a book called God's Blueprint for the Family. And in that, he describes the umbrella principle. And it's what I just described to you. You have the children, then you have the mother, you have the father, the head of the home, and the head of every man is God, right? Christ. And so that umbrella effect of the home is the way God wants it put in place. In 2 Samuel 23 and verse 3, David said that God told him, He that ruleth over men must be just ruling in the fear of God. I'll tell you this, it's an absolute honor to be married to my wife. It is an absolute honor to be the father of Abigail and Clara. And it's taken me to 41 years old to figure out 
that not a whole lot else matters in life. I, I talk to guys, young men, a lot, and, uh, and they say, you know, what, would, what kind of advice would you give me if, if uh, you know, going into the ministry and things like that? And I, I look at them and I say, why do you want to go into ministry? Well, you know, I mean, I want to preach God. It's, it's fine. It's great. Can I, can I have a raise of hand tonight of the men in this room that are not full-time in the ministry? Raise, raise them up there. It's okay. Unless you didn't put deodorant on, then don't, don't go too high. <laughs> Listen, I want you fellas to understand this. If you're a husband, being a godly husband is as much a ministry as being a pastor at a church. If you're, if you're a man tonight and you've got kids... Being a godly father to those kids is more of a ministry than being a deacon at the church. I almost titled this the ministry of the home. You sweet ladies that, that, that are in here and have three or four or five kids hanging off both hips, God bless you. If you're a godly mother to your children, I salute you. We get this all, all out of shape sometimes about well, we got to be doing this and be doing that to be right with God. And no, God said, listen, I need you to take care of that home. Because the home's the first ministry. And so to the men tonight, I want to just ask you this question. Can God count on you like he can count on Abraham? I had somebody ask me this question one time. Um, and it was a, it was a secular leadership type conference and they asked me the position that I was in as a management position they said well what's it like to be one of the people under your supervision and I thought it's glorious man I mean how could it not be you know <laughs> but as I thought about that God began to use that and when I became a pastor I'd sit back every now and then and say I wonder what it's like to be pastored by Nathan Brown I think it'd do us good, fellows, to ask that question sometimes. I got a friend that's a men's basketball coach, and, and uh, he asked me one time, he said, what kind of advice could you get me? And I said, well, coach, what's it like to be coached by you? And he sat back dazed and confused. And <laughs> he said, I'll have to think about that. But to the men tonight, the question I want to ask you is, what's it like to live at your house? I know you're the head of the home, I get that, but, but what's, it, what's it like to be under your head as the daddy? Is it enjoyable? Listen, I know, I know God told us to command our children and our house, I know that. And I'm not saying throw the commands of God to the wind, but they, listen, it ought to be more enjoyable to be at your house yeah. than at their friend's house. Right. He that troubleth his own house shall inherit the wind. I challenged the men at Spring City to do this. It didn't work out too well, so I'm going to do it here. <laughs> Maybe it was a one-off, Brother Tim. I don't know. A man, a man that ruleth well his own house is one that provides for his own home. Financially, physically, spiritually, he's the provider. It's the way God said to do it. A man that ruleth well his own house protects his house. He, he's very careful what he allows in that home. He's very careful who he allows in that home. And I won't get off on my message for tomorrow night, but you know, sometimes, gentlemen, we've got to make a decision and say, listen, that person's not coming over here anymore. A man that ruleth well his own house can will observe the effect that technology has on his wife and on his children. And if he has to make a call, he has to make a call. I teach this, maybe, maybe you don't like it, but I think, I think the man ought to set the dress standard in the home. And he kind of knows how a guy thinks. 
And your daughter may come be bopping down the stairs and think there's nothing wrong with it and total innocence. You're going to wear that out of the house and you've got to say, whoa, I've got to protect you. You can't go out there like that. A man that rules well his own house is prudent. He looks toward the future. He prepares for the future. The Bible said a good man leaveth an inheritance to his children's children. And so in essence, a man that ruleth well his own house pastors his own home. And this is a statement I made to our church. I said, if the men of this church will pastor your homes and I can pastor the men of this church, we'll do really well. It's not my job as the pastor to pastor your home. That, man, that's your job. And boy, the church, the pastor would, go, would undergo so much less stress if the men of the church would do their job. A little insight from a pastor. <laughs> Look, we're here to help you. We love you. But man, sometimes we sit there and we say, oh, if you just do that and not make me the bad guy, I'd really appreciate it. You take care of that before you got here. So what's it like to be in your home? Now, I'm, I'm, I'm finishing up. If you look back at verse 19. God said, I know Abraham, he will command his children and his household after him, meaning Abraham's going to, to lead by example. Now, I know he had some problems. I understand that. We, we, we all do. But this is God's account of this man. And so he says that he will, he will uh, command his children and his household after him. Next phrase, and they shall keep the way of the Lord. Now, many of you in here are probably familiar with, with Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16, where the Bible says, Ask for the old paths and walk therein. And the Bible says there, it is a good way. And in the end of that good way, and walking the old paths and the way God says to do it, there's a little four-letter word that everybody wants. It's called rest. Now, I am I'm by no means perfect. I haven't, I haven't nailed it all down in my home. Okay, I've still got things to work on. But I can tell you this, if I go out on a, on a pastor call or go out on a, a job site or go out on a chaplain call at the hospital or maybe even take a day and go fishing, there comes a point in that day where my mind goes back to my beautiful wife and my two girls at the house and I can't wait to get home because it's just, ah. <sighs> And we didn't get that way because we're something special. We got that way because we're trying to do it God's way. God's way is so much better than the world's way. I don't care what the pop psychologist and Planned Parenthood and Focus on the Family and all those organizations tell you how you ought to raise your family. You've got a book in your lap that tells you how to do it. And it's the good way. And it'll give you some rest and some joy and some peace if you'll do it God's way. It won't be without trouble. But for the most part, that home, listen, that home will be a sanctuary from the world. Just like this sanctuary is to be a sanctuary from the world. Amen. Romans 12, 2, God told us, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your minds. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now it says here that, Abraham will command his children, his household after him, verse 19, and they shall keep the way of the Lord. And then it says to do justice. Interesting word. If you look that word up in the 1828 dictionary, it has two primary meanings. The first primary meaning is this, and probably what most of us would associate with justice is merited punishment or impartiality. Right when, when back in the day, it doesn't happen much anymore. But back in the day, when a man murdered another man, and he was hung in the town square for everybody to see, people said, "Well, justice was done. The proper punishment, impartiality. Doesn't matter who it is. You kill somebody. God says, by your hand shall shall blood be shed.' Okay, and so in the home, there has to be some." Merited punishment. And parents, there has to be some impartiality. 
Brother Roger Hoot said this one time. I'd like to slap him for saying it. He said, I think parents ought to have, you know, 10, 12, 15 kids just so you can learn how to deal with all those different personalities. <laughs> I thought, man, I got two, and two's all I can handle. <laughs> But I can, I can say this. I, I grew up as an only child. My wife grew up as an only child. How in the world we had two kids, I don't know. I mean, when I grew up, it was me and me only, and, I, you know, the world didn't need to change. But, but it, with my girls, even, Abigail, my oldest, she, she is much more like my wife, and they, they just click. They, personalities click. My youngest daughter, Clara, and I, we click. And sometimes, you know, in their childish wisdom, they know how to play mom against dad. But justice has to be done in the home. If punishment is merited, it must be carried out. God gave you five or six verses in the book of Proverbs on the rod of correction. Impartially. So I, I don't know about that, preacher. Well, read about about what happened in Jacob and Rebecca's home with partiality and see if you want that. But also, also not only is there the rod of correction, the Bible talks about the reproof of correction. And we all know 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for correction, for reproof, and for instruction in righteousness. And if I can encourage you this with the short time I've got left, as you... As you um, Exhibit justice in your home. May it have a biblical basis. So that your children understand it's not just mom and dad's opinion, it's God's commands. So you have this justice, which is called merited punishment. And then the second definition of justice is along the lines of practical conformity. And so the first definition deals with a superior handing out a punishment to a, a subordinate, and that happens in, in court cases and things like that. Uh, the second definition of justice is really what they, what they call communicative justice, which is just between people, how we treat each other. And the Bible says that Abraham, God knew that he was going to keep the way of the Lord to do justice. In other words, he is going to teach a practical conformity to the law, to the scripture, and to godliness in his home. I hope we got parents that are raising kids with some integrity, with some honesty. That if they do wrong, they'll, they'll own up to it and not play the victim. One of, my, one of my girls, they have a favorite message that daddy preaches. It's called the blame game. Does it happen in your home? It happens in my home. Adam and Eve, just nobody wanted to take the blame. Saul played the victim. Nobody cares for me. Listen, and I'll say this to our parents tonight. If you'll be turning to Deuteronomy chapter 6 with me very quickly as we finish up. I'll say this to our parents tonight. It would do you good, Daddy. If you lose your temper and say something you shouldn't say or make a, a judgment call about something that it turns out being wrong, you will win the hearts of your kids double time if you'll sit them down and say, I was wrong, I'm sorry. Amen. Moms, it'll, it'll help you out. If you, if you make a wrong decision or, or do something you shouldn't do, sit those kids down and say, listen, I'm sorry. Don't, don't do what mommy did. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Forgive me. Deuteronomy chapter 6, we know this is God's commands to Israel, it'll be good for the church. Deuteronomy 6, 1, now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments that the Lord your God commanded to teach you that you might do them in the land whether you go to possess it, that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command thee, thou and thy son and thy son's son, all the days of thy life, and that thy days may be prolonged. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that you may increase mightily as the Lord... God of thy fathers hath promised thee in the land that floweth with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, verse 4, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words, the words which God said, which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them, and somebody tell me that next word. 
That doesn't mean one time, and if Johnny didn't get it, oh well. It's time after time after time, repetition, repetition, repetition. Diligently, on purpose. Not just hoping that, you know, throw some Bible at it and it'll stick. It's intentional. And God says, I want you to teach them diligently unto thy children. Now what? Here, here's how God said to do this. And shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house. I'd shudder to think what the conversation is in most American, quote unquote, Christian homes. If there's any conversation at all. And when thou walkest by the way. Song Brother Chris earlier before we got... Got going tonight. I got to hurry. And uh, he's talking about his little boy being outside holding a stick or chewing on a stick and holding an acorn. <laughs> Praise God, man. That's where boys belong. Amen. <laughs> but hey, 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 dad, just go get, go get your kids sometimes. Hey, come on, let's go walk. Talk to them. Talk to them about the Lord. When thou liest down, that's at bedtime. When thou risest up, good morning devotions. Thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and on thy gates. In other words, God said, you need to have the commands that I've given you out where you can see them, talk about them, memorize them, diligently teach them and put them into practice. Now back to Genesis 18. We're finished. When, when Solomon said in Proverbs 23, My son, give me thine heart. And that Abraham would command his children after him. It means that the parents are going to have to be the example they expect in their kids. Okay, I'll say that again. It means the parents have to be the example that they expect in their kids. And then I'll say this tonight. If we have grandparents in the building, would you raise your hands? Look at all you proud grandparents. Brother, you're not old enough to be a grandparent. I say this at Spring City quite often. I, we need the grandparents' generation to continue to hold the line. I had someone come to me one time, grew up in church. Parents were still in church. They were in church, raising their kids in, in, in the same church. And this young person came to me, and just sort of flippantly at the end of a service, they said, now, if, if my kids, or if I'd done what my kids did over at their grandparents' house the other day, my dad would have wore me out. And I understand maybe it's not the grandparents' position to, to, to discipline that child, but grandparents, we need you to hold the line. I know what happens to grandparents. I got four of them. And those kids learn how to play grandma and grandpa against mom and dad, and grandparents hold the line. Be the example that, and the standard that you expect your grandkids to be. I tell you what, man. I praise God for my grandparents, and I, I think my grandfather Brown was saved. Best I know he was. Um, but, man, just the life lessons that man taught me. Just hold the line. Parents, be what you expect your kids to be. Let them see your example. Let thine eyes observe my ways, Solomon said. Jesus said this in John chapter 7. And I've got ahead of myself. I have, to, I have to finish. The Bible says here that God knew that Abraham would do justice. And the last word is judgment. And boy, that sin shudders down everybody's spine these days. Judgment. It's good to judge things. Jesus said in John 7, 24, he said, Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Moms and dads, we need you teaching these kids in the home the difference between good and evil. From the Bible. Because the world's not going to do that. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, it says, He that is spiritual judgeth all things. Back to the responsibility of the father and the parents in the home. 
And so tonight, as we finish up, can God count on you to do these things that we've briefly, ever so briefly, commented on tonight in your home? Men, can God count on you to be the head of your home and to rule your home well? Ladies, can God count on you to take your position of submission to your husbands and to, to raise those kids and to love your husband, to love your kids? Can he count on you to do that? And children, let's see the children's hands tonight. Amen. Can God count on you guys to obey your parents and the Lord? Can God count on you all to honor your father and your mother? I hope so. Let's pray. Father, we love you tonight. Thank you for the Bible. Lord, there's such a, a, a seemingly shallow start to a, a Bible conference with such depth. Lord, I pray you'll take something I've said and minister to the hearts of the people that are here tonight. That we might please you and we might serve you better in the days to come. Pray you'd strengthen